won to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, thrilled to be opening the season today. We're back. Uh, yeah. Well, I like you guys already. I really do. Uh, my name is Christina Hamilton, the series director, and I am thrilled to be at the top of what promises to be a great season. Uh, we have a dynamic roster of guests to challenge and inspire you, details of which are listed in the new season calendar, which is available in the lobby, and you should grab one on the way out, or you can always find us at pennystampsevents.org. Sign up to receive an email or join us on social channels at Penny Stamp Series, but plan to be here every Thursday. Today, we welcome back to the series artist, activist, and Pussy Riot founder, <laughs> who obviously needs no introduction, Nadia Tolokonikova. Yes. Nadia was here with us uh, nine years ago, shortly after she was released from prison, and we're very excited to catch up with her today. Uh, but first, a big thank you to our partners for their support of today's program. The Arts and Resistance LSNA theme semester, which we'll be hearing a lot about, UM Democracy and Debate, and the UM Arts Initiative. So today's show is going to come with a little variety. We're going to start off today with a short video work uh, of Nadia's, and then Nadia will make an address uh, directly to you, and then I'll join her on stage here for a bit of a conversation, and eventually we'll get to open the floor up to you. You can see there's microphones at the ends of the two aisles here, and when we get to that moment, you can come and line up and see if we have time for we, us to get to your question. For folks up in the balcony, if you want to join for the Q&A, please do come downstairs and line up at a microphone. So for just a few words of introduction and to catch you up with what's going on with our guests today. Nadia Tolokonikova is the creator of Pussy Riot, the Russian feminist art collective, and she gained global recognition when she was sentenced to two years of prison uh, for performing Punk Prayer, an anti-Putin performance that she and rioters staged at the altar of a cathedral in Moscow. She then started a hunger strike in prison, protesting the conditions in which she was held and was ultimately sent to Siberia. She was released then in December 2013, after two years. She is still, and has always been, a longtime thorn in Putin's side. Uh, she was declared recently, uh, in 2021, a foreign agent by Russia and is most wanted by Putin. Uh, she's made herself geo-anonymous ever since, and many other uh, members of Pussy Riot active in Russia have also been forced to leave the country uh, since the start of the war in Ukraine, where protesting in Russia is pretty much impossible without having a lengthy pres pr prison sentence uh, waged against you. Still, uh, she continues on with her unique brand of political resistance, incorporating guerrilla gigs, music videos, visual art, performances, and experiments with the egalitarian potential of Web3. Yes, she is a Web3 guru. Uh, she's also co-founder of the independent news service and media outlet Media Zona. Uh, and co-founder of Unicorn DAO, which is a collector's decentralized autonomous organization uh, dedicated to collecting and incubating NFTs created by female, non-binary, and LGBTQ plus artists. Unicorn DAO was launched following her work on Ukraine DAO, which she raised over $7 million in crypto for Ukraine at the start of the Russian invasion. She has spoken before the US Congress, British Parliament, European Parliament, and recently she was awarded the Woody Guthrie Prize. Yeah! What a woman. She puts her whole being into her work of resistance and as Peter Verzalov said, you cannot change the world as a hobby on weekends. So without further ado, well, let's watch Putin's ashes. If this works for me.
August 17th, 2012. You're standing up in a cage, handcuffed. The judge reads your sentence for four long hours. Your cage is surrounded by nine guards in balaclavas, and a guard dog is angrily barking at you. She's trained to be suspicious towards humans who smell like prison. You're stripped down from your humanity. You're reduced to being just a prisoner. I was 22 and I smelled like prison. The prosecutor asked to give me three years for making political performance. My crime is classified as a severe one. It means the judge can give me up to seven years. As the judge reads my sentence, I'm thinking to myself, can, one make, can just one person make a difference? Is it even worth trying? Am I setting myself up for a failure? Am I, will I inevitably be smashed by the system? I ran away from home when I was 16. I moved from a little provincial city in Siberia to Moscow. I was 16 and I was a dreamer. I wanted two things, to dream wildly and to make my utopian dreams come true. For that, I knew I needed to be in Moscow. I studied philosophy and I was stealing food and clothes in order to survive. At 22, I was thrown in jail for going against one of the most dangerous politicians, dictators on earth. My daughter turned four on the day when I got arrested. What is my crime exactly? I sang a song. Virgin Mary, please get rid of Putin. Five of us, Pussy Riot members, preached in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, from the spot that for thousands of years was reserved only for male preachers. We sang our punk prayer in response to Putin announcing that he will rule Russia pretty much forever. 
I dropped everything and I gave myself a promise that I will dedicate my life to resistance. Putin equals death, humiliation, torture, a knife in the back, imprisonment, darkness, eternal winter, stagnation, the new dark ages for Russia. To resist, we used our brains, courage, balaclavas, loud voices, uh, we borrowed guitar and bright dresses from our friends, and performance art. We shared the truth with people of Russia, performing guerrilla style, no permits, on the squares, government buildings, public transport. We would be arrested almost every single day, but we'd get out of a police station and go back to the streets. Our goal was to show Russian people that resisting is indeed an option. The supreme, sacred, holy rule in Russia is to remain afraid. We decided to break this rule. By breaking the main rule of the game, we disrupted the game as such. We shattered the world of appearances, the fundamental pillar of the system. We demonstrated that living a lie is exactly what it is, living a lie. We said that the emperor is naked. Did we achieve what we wanted? I was thinking about it while I was standing behind the bars and listening to the judge reading my sentence. Yes and no. As I said in my closing statement, even though we are behind bars, we are freer than the people prosecuting us. We can say what we want while they can say only what political censorship allows. Despite the global movement in support of Pussy Riot, we were sentenced to two years of hard labor. The hell was in front of me. I was forced to sew police and military uniforms, getting injured while doing it. But even in the moments of my darkest apathy, I knew that my fight is not over. Two years later, um, we'll get out of prison alive. And I will meet thousands of inspiring young Russians who will tell me how our courage inspired them to resist. Over the next 10 years, Pusirat will continue to build a network and tools for effective resistance. In 2014, we'll launch one of the biggest free of censorship media outlets in Russia, Mediazona, that is thriving up to this day and is at top five biggest independent media outlets in Russia. In March 2022, we raised $7 million for Ukraine. When reproductive rights were under attack in America, we raised close to a million dollars for Planned Parenthood. We raised two million dollars to collect works, artworks by women and non-binary artists as unicorn doll. And I wish I could tell all of that to a 22 years old version of myself who was standing in a cage and listening to this harsh prison sentence, two years in jail. Much work remains to be done. In Russia, my friends and family have been beaten, jailed, poisoned, murdered. In March 2023, I was added to Russia's most wanted list. I'm facing new criminal charges for art I have made. You've just seen it. On the screen, it's called Putin's Ashes. And it, um, the screams that you've heard in the end are screams of a person being tortured in uh, a Russian police department. 
I became a threat to the system, not because of any physical or actual power I have, but because courage is contagious. Just one act of speaking the truth might cause incalculable transformations in social consciousness. And we all have this power. It's a moral act to use this power. It might bring results you wanted, it may not. But there is an eternal beauty in making this leap of faith and stop calculating profits and risking everything you have for what is right. Courage is an ability to act in the face of fear. For some of us, living courageously is a choice. For others, like our comrades in Ukraine, it's not a choice. It's a matter of survival. Putin is embarrassed that Ukraine chose democracy. Russian army bombs hospitals, maternity wards, schools, raping and killing civilians and throwing their bodies in mass graves. Putin and everyone who supports him must be stopped. Putin is a war criminal. And I cannot wait, I cannot wait to see him in Hog in the International Court of Justice for his crimes against humanity. <laughs> Russia has to get the fuck out of Ukraine. Donbass, Crimean, is Ukraine, and I will not stop until Russia is 100% out of Ukraine. And, and I believe we should do everything that's in our hands in order to support Ukraine. That's why I'm supporting not just humanitarian efforts of Ukraine, but also military efforts of Ukraine, because that's the way how they protect themselves from an aggressor. Putin did not just strip me away from my freedom and mental health. He stole my identity. I don't know anymore what does it mean to be a person from Russia. I used to be proud of being Russian, now I am ashamed. I'm eternally saddened that we were not effective enough, that we were not able to get rid of Putin at the right time, before it's too late. My homeland is stolen from me, and I don't have identity anymore. But unlike many other colleagues of mine, I still have the privilege of being alive. My brave colleague, anti-Putin activist Kara Murza, who was sentenced earlier this year for 25 years in a penal colony for publicly denouncing Putin and the war in Ukraine, said in his closing statement, I know that the day will come when the darkness engulfing our country will dissipate. This day will come as inevitably as spring comes to replace, to replace even the frostiest winter. And I'll finish this short speech with the words of a 22 years, 22 years old version of myself, who hoped for a beautiful new Russia of the future, standing in the cage. Passion, openness, and naivete are superior to hypocrisy, cunning, and contrived decency that conceals crimes. Thank you.
Well, let's chat now. <sighs> well, it's really an honor to have you come back and let us catch up with you again uh, and, and see how much you, know, you continue to grow and, and transform uh, with your work, so. Doing my best, always can be better. <laughs> Yeah, you're doing your best. I think so. I, you know, you're now geo anonymous, but it's very obvious that your home is in your convictions, and uh, you know your clarity of purpose, and with art clearly as your tool, uh, your certitude is very inspiring. Yeah. However, I know that we have a lot of young students in the audience here who maybe are not in such clear waters um, and they're trying to figure out who they are and what their voice is, you know. So I wonder if, you know, we can go back and you can connect us, as you just did a lot, you know, to this time in your life when you're a teenager and you move to Moscow and you find yourself getting involved with protest. And, and what was it? Was there, you know, when was it that you really thought, oh, wow, this is my calling, like I'm a performance artist. Was there a clear moment or an mm, early protest? It's never really clear, I think. I mean, rarely. I think it's fictionalized. People mostly rationalize those moments. I, I think it's just like always a, a, a series of moments. I was um, really drawn to performance art ever since I learned about it. And I learned about it by um, almost by chance. Because um, I was living in a super small provincial city where usually we don't even have books on contemporary art. Um, but luckily, it was that moment, 2006, when Russia was still trying to be like kind of modern, enlightened state. And um, so this a sister, amazing woman, a sister of oligarch, who is terrible human, Putin supporter, but his sister is great, as it happens with women. So she brought this <laughs> a festival to my city. It was performance, conceptual art, and I've learned about it because of that festival, so it was really just a chance. If I was three years later, I probably would not learn about it. Um, but I right away captured this moment of freedom that I felt from um, these performers who came. Because I felt like, you know, I, I, I suffered from the fact that everyone around me treated their themselves and their lives way too seriously. And I think it comes from the fact that it's really difficult to be an adult. And now I understand it is. So you just like turn into this person who's just treating everything so seriously. And it was difficult for me to uh, relate to it somehow as a teenager. So I see this playful adults who are like in, in their 40s and their 50s, but they're still playing. And even though it's, it is difficult and they still have to pay their bills and make a living somehow, um, they maintain, like, they, I guess, it is the goal of their existence to maintain this playground. Um, life is their playground. And I've decided that I want to just be one of them. <laughs> and I was, I guess politics came kind of together with it. It's not necessarily part of it. I think it's just another current in my life that came probably from my father and um, I guess my mother as well, being really involved with perestroika and being really interested in changes, then getting really disillusioned with everything when Putin came to power. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, um, I guess, um, took it from them because uh, we would always have political magazines in our house, which was not a common place in, in, my, in my birth city. Hmm. So Putin was always, a, a, has been a real progenitor for, of your, in, motivator for you, even from the very, very beginning. Uh, from the beginning, I didn't, um, I didn't like him. He, he I don't know, I, I thought he looks like a fish from a can, like, <laughs> like a dead person. I did not like him. I was 10 when he got elected, or elected. <laughs> mm, 
So my first reaction was bad, and then he canceled my birthday. Because <laughs> my birthday is on the day of Russian Revolution, and he doesn't like anything that's connected to political changes. So he canceled my birthday, and I had to go to school on my birthday. <laughs> so that was my first beef. The real him. root. We get the real root here. OK, so I forgot the clicker, so I have but I think I can get through this. So I know, um, you know, one of, one of the things I'm curious about with all your, you know, your, your co-rioters, when you form the group, you know, you're all living really closely together, doing lots of actions. And then now in this situation where you're all sort of displaced and uprooted around the world, are you still able to collaborate together or are each of you really, has this caused each of you sort of to be really working independently? Pretty much independently. Um, we were not banned in a classical sense, so we were just, um, you know, people with their own tra tragic tra trajectories, and we came together for a specific purpose, and then just we still um, do things when it makes sense. But for the most part, we just lead our parallel lives. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, you know, obviously here's the the the, the famous moment uh, before the arrest. And there's this moment that I have to ask you about uh, when you were uh, going through the trial and you were getting sentenced. And during sentencing, you made a statement to the prosecutor. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. This is, a, this is a funky little thing. Uh, you made a statement to the prosecutor sort of saying, well, I'm, the only, I'm really the one that's free because I can say everything that I want to say and you are actually the ones that are being censored by the system because you're, you know, sticking with the system here. And then, you know, you, you, this moment becomes this global, you know, attention on you and so it's like this moment where they, the powers that be are trying to silence you and put you away and put you in a prison. But you leverage this moment, and this seems like an essential uh, talent for someone who's going to be a political activist and artist. So how, from behind bars, if you can kind of just explain in the primer of like, what does one do when one's arrested and, 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 and get, a, get, get the global media attention? How did, how did you do that from behind bars? Are you preparing for Trump becoming president? <laughs> No, right? Um, ooh, I wish we didn't have to have this skill. And I never intentionally wanted to have this skill. And I know artists who were prepared for it very intentionally from the beginning of conceiving their actions. They would know that, it, like my friend who burned the door of the FSB building on the bank. Well, he used to be my friend, not anymore. Um, long story. Did wrong things. Um, so he knew uh, from the beginning that he's going to be um, dealing with the system. So I wasn't, um, I wasn't that kind of artist. I was thinking that we we're going to be able to get away from it because we had this conversation within our um, group. Should we do? symbolic actions or should we actually destroy property, should we burn police cars or should we do symbolic things. And I was on the side of let's do symbolic stuff because it's going to be really difficult for the government to put you in jail for that. And if they do, they're going to look like assholes, which like plan B worked. <laughs> um, I was not totally prepared for it, but I think just by um, by living in Russia and reading our, you know, reading Russian dissidents and learning Russian history, you realize that one of the most virtuous and kind and smart and educated people, they always somehow end up in prison for um, this, like for some sort of political article. Like you look at Dostoevsky, who is the most known person from Russia, perhaps. Or Tolstoy, he didn't end up in jail, but he was, um, what is anathema? I don't know how to say it, but anyway, he got, he went through this like sort of religious trial that, and they told him he cannot be part of the um, Orthodox Church anymore because he's blasphemous. Dostoevsky was sentenced to death 
and then he just magically got out of it. Anyway, so he learned about it, all of it, and then Pushkin got in trouble as well. So everyone who has conscience and, I guess, heart in Russia, they end up in troubles anyway. So mm. it's not the goal of your of our school to teach you that because they definitely not like, like a rebel boot camp by no means. But right. I think if you really look at Russian history, you understand that maybe it can, it can be part of your history as well if you're going to be good enough um, as, as an artist, as, a, as an artist who wants to be honest with herself. And so when we ended up in jail, um, the calculation was really simple. You had just one moment when you can talk with everyone because I could not even write things. If I write things down, everything will be taken away from me. Mm. So they really tried to erase not just my physical freedom, but my internal freedom, which I thought I owned, but I actually didn't. Mm. So I could not, I mean, I could learn by heart probably a lot of things, but I don't have good memory. So I was like writing things in my, myself, like just trying to memorize. It was really difficult not to have any sort of outlet. So the court hearings were the only outlets when you can actually legally bring some papers because legally it's, oh, it's just like my last statement, so you cannot take it away from me. So it, I guess the reason why it was so striking for a lot of people because it was something that was brewing inside of us for mm. six, eight months, and then finally just <laughs> Wow. I hadn't, I hadn't realized that, that you couldn't write anything down besides that. That's amazing. I could, I would write, you know, but then they would come with um, right. search Confiscate. and just take it, everything. So yeah. then it kind of, I think I, I'm still struggling with PTSD from it because it just gave me this feeling like, oh, everything I do is kind of pointless because it's going to be destroyed anyway. Yeah. And that's why cops constantly, like even when they got out of jail, they would constantly do raids in our apartments, like studios, whatever we try to do, try to shoot a music video, they shut it down. Mm. And so everything you try to do, you, like, you try to do a queer party, you could do, try to do um, a fundraiser for um, queer people in Russia, for queer people in Chechnya, everything gets shut down. And then after a few years of that, you just feel like, oh, well, everything I do is pointless. So, moving to the current moment, uh, you know, your, uh, your, you, your recent work has really expanded in form, uh, you know, from, you know, uh, actions and performances to object making, you know, making objects now. Um, and you just have had a gallery installation, uh, which first was at the Deitch Projects in LA, very fancy address, uh, and then recently was in New Mexico at Container in uh, Santa Fe. And I, I, I want us to, you know, look at some of, uh, go through and look at some of the work and talk about it. Um, and there's a term in this instant, in, when I've heard you talking, uh, you know, whatever, on, on news stories about this, you talk about the total installation. So, and I, I, I have this picture still up for a reason because one of the uh, parts of this installation is a recreation of your cell. And also, it was on hunger strike. Oh, that photo was taking, like the previous one. I was on hunger strike, and uh, um, a human rights person came to visit me. And uh, um, I was on hunger strike against uh, eight here, uh, eight, uh, eight hour, fucking, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 16 hours work day, um, and oh. terrible living conditions, no access to medical health, uh, medical help for not just for myself but for every other prisoner and uh, yeah and I was just uh, isolated in this cell because I asked 
myself to get myself isolated because the way they punished me before, they punished me from other people. So if you're my friend in jail, they punish not me but you. They um, strip you from um, your right to have a parole and then I feel terrible because you have to serve four years in jail like four top years in jail because of me, because of being friends with me. So I said, just isolate me in this um, just one person cell, and so you cannot influence me through others. And so this is the recreation of the cell in the exhibition. Um, and this is another image of it with the lighting, which is striking, with the bars in the light, everything. Um, but yeah, can you talk about what this term total installation uh, and what that, that means to you? There is this amazing artist, um, Ilya Kobakov. Some of you probably know him. If you don't, Google Ilya Kabakov. <laughs> it's uh, totally amazing. Like He's one of the most famous um, I want to say living Russian artist, but he just passed away earlier this year. Yeah. And he's one of my teachers, gurus. Like, I mean, we never met in person, but he's just spiritually always with me. Um, and he came up with this idea of a total installation um, that you work with a white cube of a gallery or a museum and to turning it into something completely different and re recontextualizing it and making the, um, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of similar to Bertolt Brecht idea of breaking the fourth wall, because you feel closer to the creator of the installation. And he did it in response to, um, so he started to work in America, because he, he moved out of the uh, USSR like before, 1950, 1980, 85, I think. So it was towards the end of the USSR, but he still didn't know that it's the end of the USSR. So he was lucky enough to be able to move, um, but he was just like, how do I explain to the Westerners the whole context of what I was doing back in the USSR? Because before he was doing like much more laconic and cryptic pieces, like just like so super simple drawing. And then he was like, I, I have to provide them with the whole context, um, feed them, and almost like create a Disneyland type experience for them to really, not because they're stupid, but because they don't know the experience of living in a Soviet apartment that he, mm -hmm. he knew. So for him, they, um, breakthrough out at the Western scene for him was um, this installation that he did in uh, Germany and it was called Toilet. And he recreated this toilet made of concrete with um, an installation of a like, typical Soviet apartment inside. Mm. It's like Soviet people li <laughs> live in shit, kind of that, that, that thought. And everyone was like, oh my God, this is so genius, oh my God. And I think it was genius. So um, he, I think he's the only one who uses this term total installation and I picked it up, picked it up from him. Wow. And I also, to me, it's, I guess it just makes simpler the transition from performance art, from performing guerrilla really style on the street to work with it uh, in, in a context of white cube because mm. I still struggle with it at times because I don't understand like what, what is this wall standing here for, what does it mean? You know, let's look at some of the walls uh, in the installation. These are shanks, right? Yeah, prison, prison shanks. It's um, knife play and uh, the idea is, um, well, I didn't do them in jail because I would not be able to bring anything that I did yeah. in jail, but um, they're done later. Um, but the idea is to create something that you can protect yourself with. Mm -hmm. Um, in jail, but also it just like honestly derives from very banal move of, um, so we would open a can of um, whatever, peas, and um, you save this um, cap, and with this cap you can cut something else, because you don't have knives when you're in jail. Right. So this is the simplest form of this shank or shave. 
which is also features in this series. Yeah, these are, I, 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 I'm really curious about the, the choice of the fur on the uh, frames. Um, if you think about name Pussy Riot, um, we had just um, recently a conversation with Guerrilla Girls, um, and I, I told them that we basically stole the name from them, because <laughs> the interviewer was like, um, did you know about Guerrilla Girls when he invented Pussy Riot? I was like, yeah, duh, <laughs> we stole the name from them, because it's a combination of something I mean, like, it doesn't matter how you read it, guerrilla or gorilla, it's something <sighs> tough. And girls, which is like traditionally is whatever, you know, sexist um, stereotypes about girls. And pussy right is the same, it's something um, nice and soft and welcoming, mm. like whatever, and, and, da, 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 and, and, and riot. So I like to combine different, um, I guess, mediums and messages and uh, make them pretty contrast. Mm -hmm. I get it. And so for, I guess, stands for this, like nice and feminine and whatever, and you don't expect anything bad to happen and, and, you, and you have like a very radical statement inside. Yeah. So this is what, moving through the middle of the, the space, I mean, I guess I need to understand that a little more in some of these because I, when I was looking at all the images that you sent, since I didn't have the great privilege to go to this exhibition, which I we'll hope make it I happen. have. I, I, I know we're, this is going to happen because... Now we'll it, just make an exhibit together. Yeah, it, ha it has to happen again. And that we, we, This needs to be seen by many more people. But anyway, because you talked about the white cube, but I'm not... It, was it really... A, or this is the container space, so it's actually like an oblong container that, that all of this is in? Yeah. Yeah, they put a lot of containers together and this mm -hmm. how they, they did this space. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a pretty awesome idea. Um, Tell me so, about the barrels, too. The barrels. It happened just by accident. So I work with this Ukrainian team um, led by Val Zbaluev. Mm -hmm. um, they work with me from the beginning of Putin's Ashes. And um, they just brought a bunch of barrels because like, he was just like, barrels are going to look so good in this space. And, um, and then he was just like, just paint them, just paint them. I was like, no, we have so much work, like whatever. We have so much other things to focus on. He was just like, whatever, I like and him. There was like, no, no, she should just do it. And I did it, um, you know, a few days before the opening. There's more, Barrel. Okay, so this piece, tell us about this doll's house. It's um, called Haunted, and this piece, um, this piece happened because, well, I struggle with mental health um, as it happens sometimes with people who went through traumatic experiences. So um, ever since, was I here in 2014? Sorry? Was I here in 2014? Yeah. Yes, you were. You were here in September of 2014. So I wasn't myself, just for the record. I was out of my mind. I was so depressed. And I didn't, I didn't recognize that I was depressed because unfortunately we have this, still have this stigma. Like strong people don't get depressed. And I was thinking, oh, I'm strong. It's like, no, whatever. We never had this mental health education. I never had it. I ended up going through a number of doctors that fall, and I felt horrible, and I was just like, something is wrong with me. I just feel like I want to die. And they're like, no, but they, they made all sorts of scans of me, but I was totally fine. And then they gave me these pills. I was just like, what is it? Antidepressants. I was like, no, I don't need antidepressants. I can regulate my own mood. Um, well, long story short, I'm still on Cymbalta, which looks just like this. Uh. And I tried to get off it multiple times. It's really difficult. Mm. If you ask me, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Honestly, I think it saved me at the time, but then later it got me addicted to it, which is not good as well. So, like, if you can just 
I mean, there are a lot of young people here. Maybe some of you are into neuroscience. Can we please learn more about brain and how it functions and how it can... In, in mm -hmm. <laughs> And can we invent something that does not make us addicted? Because I've tried to get off them multiple times, and every time I'm like, I'm like this guy who's melting. <laughs> <laughs> so this piece is about my trauma and big pharma, because then I studied a lot of um, lawsuits were going against this um, Lily, I believe, this pharmacy company, big pharma company. And they always settle the lawsuits, as it always happens in America somehow. Um, so, yeah, this mental health type beat. So this show, or the Putin's Ashes, the film that we watched, is you know very much a part of this. The whole show is called Putin's Ashes, right? The the the, the total installation. Yeah. Um, and so this is. Uh, what has now got you on this foreign agent list? Yeah. Um, and what what is what is uh, I, I was trying to read about this to understand what this means for you specifically, and it sounds like there's a lot of like requirements and and things that you're supposed to be doing because you're on this list under the laws of Russia. Can you explain? My official comment about it was LOL. And "idite v which means in Russian, go to ass. It's going to fuck you in Russian. So most of the Russian dissidents, they don't really follow that law. And, well, so OK, like being on the foreign agent list is, is a drama, but it's not such a big drama for me. Like biggest drama for me is to be on the Russia uh, Russia's most wanted list, mm -hmm. which just comes. I, I I've heard about it at first, and I was like, oh well, this is so cool. And then I realized that it comes with a pretty heavy price, so I cannot travel in a bunch of countries um, that can work with Russia on extraditing me. For example, Indonesia mm. or wow. you know, Armenia or like, a lot of other countries who are mm. close to Putin. I, and honestly, I don't even know about Brazil anymore. I used to love traveling yeah. there, performing there. Um, so there is that. And also, I'm basically a, a stateless person right now because I'm rejected by the Russian government. This is the only passport I have. Um, if any of you know how to get American passports really quick, please let me know. <laughs> Seriously. There must be a way. I just don't know about it. <laughs> but I'm literally like, I feel like, I, so if I lose my passport, I, I'm just fucked. Because I cannot get another one from the Russian embassy. I hope the expiration <laughs> date is a long way away. And I don't know, I hope that Biden will be like, oh, yeah, she just, 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 just suffered enough, so we'll that just give serious. her a passport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you need a passport. So basically... So if anyone you have phone of Joe Biden, by the way, that I'll gladly text him. I know he's in a lot of troubles right now, but yeah. maybe tomorrow. So, so you can't... So, you know, basically for you... you Going back to your homeland is impossible until it's possible. Go directly or... to jail. I mean, like, yeah, I... no, 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 no. I mean, go. I mean, go back to your homeland and your free with your freedom. Yeah. Uh, that you can't. This is not possible. I mean, do you think in some way, if Putin, you know, if Ukraine wins the war and there's hope? My only hope is for Ukraine to win the war. And that's why it's not just Ukraine's war, it's my war, and it's war of everyone who wishes Russia the best. So really, I don't count on Putin dying suddenly, because he has good medics. He, he's in pretty, I mean, you cannot really base your um, actions on expecting somebody to just die suddenly. So. 
I just think that he probably will stay around for, for a while. Um, so I really think my best chance is just for Ukraine to win. Because the reason why he fought Ukraine is, is none of that bullshit that he names as the reason he, by the way, changes official reasoning all the time. But he got jealous that they chose freedom and they're on the way to become just a regular European country. Mm. And he doesn't want, he knows that a lot of Russians want that as well for Russia. People like me, but so many others. We dreamt, I mean, like we thought in the, in the 90s that we would become just a normal European country. And when I was eight, I was thinking that's my last visa I have to get to enter France. Because I was thinking, oh, visas are so horrible. It's just so dehumanizing. I have to prove that I'm wealthy enough, beautiful enough, great enough. Like, I don't want to stay in a country. It's just dehumanizing. It's terrible. So I was thinking, just, you know, a few years and we'll be part of Europe. And a lot of people still want it. And so if Ukraine would be effective in it. I think it would encourage a lot of Russians. But... Um, it still can happen. Yeah, it's going to happen. It has to happen. So I, I, I love this this image um, uh, because Judy Chicago is amazing. Uh, and uh, by the way, folks, Judy Chicago is opening a big show at the New Museum in October in New York. You should all go see it. Uh, but anyway, I want to. <laughs> you, you know, part of this expanse, expansion of your work has also been you've been collaborating with a lot of fantastic people here in the U.S., and you've also, you know, gone beyond, you know, your core mission and your work, uh, you know, resisting and protesting Putin and his actions. You've actually taken up a lot of the issues that are hot button issues in this country, in the United States, uh, like the, the you know reproductive rights and this with the overturn of Roe v. Wade last year. Um, and I, I'm just interested to hear some you know observations and reflections from you on this country. It's you know we can't necessarily always see ourselves, and you're coming at it with a you know from a very different perspective, um, and you've been working now in doing projects in this country for a while. And I'm, I'm curious about how you see the landscape of artists and activists and, and how you see the land of the free, you know, how free is the land of the free? Uh, you know, do you see people, uh, you know, um, taking for granted the freedoms they have? Or do you see, you know, oh, free speech is, you know, alive and well and resistance is robust. What's your, what is, what is your reflection on that back for us? Well, I'm not trying to be saver of this country, um, but if I can just say I have a freedom to complain. So we will be found out with Guerrilla Girls. We have in common, we love to complain, and we made our art into art of complaining. Uh, I think um, before the first Trump term, there was definitely a problem that people, I, I felt like young people are taking for granted freedoms they have here because they were mostly gained by someone else, like their parents or their grandparents. I feel like Trump changed it a lot. But it's... Um, uh, so many people live in a... Especially artists live in a tough economic situation here and they don't have safety net. Um, and it's not a country that works on building the safety net, like free healthcare, free education, um, affordable living. Um, and I feel like just because political art just exposes you to so many more risks. Like today I was told that actually my insurance company charges me three times more than everyone else just because I'm a political artist. That's ridiculous. Um, and I was just like, well, like, I'm not able to pay this amount of money, so let's just say them, to them that, oh, I could be in political. <laughs> um, 
I know that generally political art doesn't sell as much uh, for, 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 for as much as non-political. So, well, long story short, I understand people who do not want to be super vocal about um, political issues, but also I would love to see much bigger movement and more coordination on a global scale. Um, what I really loved about Russian civil life, when we still had one, I wouldn't say that we still have it because everyone was destroyed, but at the moment of possibilities when it was kind of doable, we were building a lot of coalitions across the country, and I feel like this is the best way to show your government that it's time for them to shit their pants because we are together and we're not here to fight with each other. I mean, sometimes to fight with each other, but generally we're here to support each other and the same agenda. When um, reproductive rights failure happened with this country, I was really upset because I spent two years in jail, not just for going against Putin, but also for being a feminist. Mm -hmm. It's in my uh, prison sentence, they say, being a feminist goes against traditional Russian values, so it means she's corrupted, blasphemous, whatever. She's um, really dangerous for society, and she has to be separated from society for two years in order to um, get better, and then after release back. So um, I was just talking about um, Theano. Theano is um, a... Um, philosopher astronomer from um, Alexandria and she was burned and tortured by uh, Christian fanatics in third or fourth century I believe anyway so the reason I was talking about it because uh, she features in uh, Judy Chicago's the dinner party mm -hmm. in uh, the Brooklyn Museum you should go to the Brooklyn Museum and see it if you haven't and um, so there was a funny kind of story with Siano. I wrote down a note about her and then my investigators found it and they said, oh, she's dangerous for society, she's blasphemous, she is against Christianity in our country because she wrote about Siano being burned by Christian fanatics. Anyway, so when that thing happened, when Roe Wade was overturned in the United States, I was really upset because it was just like, oh, well, this is just like kind of like fucking bad luck because I, I just, I got two years in my own country. Here is the country where I do a lot of my projects and I have a lot of friends and it goes into shit as well. So um, I'll try to do something. So what we did is just um, raised money, but obviously it's not enough. Um, I think building alternative system and really building alternative even healthcare system, it's something that we need and access to abortion pills. Because really when our government uh, let us down, we just have to build our own alternative government. Yeah. That's a perfect segue, actually, to my last question for you. Uh, because I've heard you refer to yourself as an anarchist, and I've also heard you talk about alter-globalists. And the alter-globalist movement, for those of you in the audience who haven't heard of it before, it's a social movement which supports global cooperation but opposes the negative effects of e economic globalization, but it doesn't completely oppose a free market. So do you see in the future, in your, if, if, if the future could be you know, what you want, do you see that we have a potential for a future without borders where we leave the nation state and empire building behind? Um, and I'm very curious how the economy works and if this is where Web3 and blockchain come in. <laughs> That's a big question for me. This is when I, um, I wished I listened to my mother and I studied economy. <gasps> we all should have done that. <laughs> yeah, because my mom was just like, I should become a lawyer or economist. And at the time, I was thinking this is the most boring shit on the planet. And now I'm like, 
no, I, I, I need to know exactly those two things. So my mom was right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how it will work exactly, but um, Vitalik Buterin talks a lot about it. And um, his comrade, economist Glenn Bile, who's more on the libertarian side, so I didn't necessarily agree with everything he says, but you probably can just um, listen to them talking about it or my conversation with Vitalik Buterin. I do think just, I mean, from the bird's eye view, I do think that nation states, well, they were formed and like they, like imaginary communities, right? They, they were formed not that long time ago and at some point they will be, uh, not dissolved, uh, they probably will be still part of our identity, but they will play much less role that they do play now because even today they feel really, really abusive for no reason because I always hate thinking that, you know, this glass has more rights than I do because this class can travel to the UK and I cannot because I don't have a visa. That is not a good position to be in. I hope you can get a passport. I have to push you though to talk a little bit about Web3 and blockchain and if you see that has any potential as in part of the economy, you know, to get, how do we, because we are completely you know, ruled by this market economy and these corporations, you know, what can blockchain do for us? I'm a really humble person when it comes to Web3. I just use it for my own purposes. So I'm not really a spokesperson for Web3, but I came with a very, single, with a very simple goal to um, be able to capture these amazing new tools for activism, what I believe in. So I think what's good about Web3 is also simultaneously as it happens, also the same thing what is bad about it. So it's unregulated. So it means that on the one hand, when you need to send money to Ukraine, really quick, you can do it. When you need to send money from Ukraine, uh, to Ukraine from Russia, you can use blockchain for that. Um, so when the war in Ukraine started, we were looking into ways how to raise money for it quickly and effectively. And traditional sources like Indiegogo, Patreon, they all blocked and just frozen accounts of people who were raising money because they were scared. They didn't know how the American government will, I mean, whatever, any other government will look at it. With, is it funding war? Is it buying weapons? Because mm -hmm. some of this money may go to buy weapons, right? So we had to look for other ways. So blockchain, at least for now, offers you more flexible solutions. You have to use it consciously and I mean you have to do your own research um, you cannot just because it's unregulated nobody's going to check for you if you're not going to check for yourself so I would not necessarily right now uh, recommend it to everyone but I found that in a situation when corporations or governments try, try you to stop from doing something blockchain can be a really useful resource. Okay. Well, I think we can open it to questions. Um, and thank you, Nadia, for all of your thoughts. Um, I hope we can have you back again.